So. Okay, thanks, Sandra. So I also show captions. You can try. Okay. If it doesn't, I uh... love the captions. Also, they are not perfect, but they are. We'll try. I hope I can see the content of the slides. Uh, right. Put a, a note bar over my one. Um, I will start slowly and hope um, some more people will still join. We also are still waiting for some of the authors, actually, who confirmed to join us today. Nadine is already here as one of our authors of the Global Public uh, Perspectives publication. And uh, so very warm wel welcome. I'm really happy to have you with us. And I hope some of your fellow writers are still going to join the room. Um, since we have questions to you. Uh, <coughs> okay, so I thought to can I switch the slides now. Yeah, to very briefly go through what is COACT and how did the Global Perspectives uh, publication come about before, uh, and, and why we did this. Then uh, briefly introduce the contributions we have so far together with the authors who wrote these really outstanding contributions and then give room to have a little conversation to have, uh, I also have some questions to our authors and then opening up the room and also jointly uh, reflect on where where should this go? Since we don't really as co-act uh, um, as a final or as, a, as an official project is coming to its um, end of the project timeframe, we don't see this as an end. We want to keep things going and carry on and move ahead and so this is the same for this publication or this this project within the project. So that's roughly what's going to happen now. Um, yeah, most of you by right now know. So I go really fast through this. Uh, um, the global perspective perspectives is uh, activity happening within the COAC project, which is in Horizon 2020 um, funded grant project, so European grant project which um, the Global Innovation Gathering is part of as a consortium member. We are a quite big number of uh, multi-stakeholder, um, academic and non-academic, so academic and, and um, civil society organizations um, working together on this, which you all see here. Um, we bring together actors from Germany, Austria, Spain, and Argentina to work on three distinct topics. Well, four overall, we also have a, 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 had an open call on gender equality, but our four departing topics were mental health care um, with groups of actors in, in Barcelona, Spain, youth employment uh, in Vienna, Austria, and environmental justice in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So the, the goal of this um, Horizon project was to develop a citizen social science approach. So that meaning by doing so through these three, what we call research and innovation actions to explore and to document and to try out, succeed and fail and take learnings from this on how citizen social science. So meaning equal participation of citizen groups in research, institutional research, which doesn't need to be academic institutional though, um could look like and yeah this is where i already come to how how did the global perspectives uh, pers um, publication come about so as gig of course what we strongly bring into coact is our global network our global perspectives our very critical perspectives also on um how how certain change mechanisms be it in terms of research or development cooperation is done in an inclusive in a representative way in a decolonial manner etc so where we were as we were working on on the research and innovation actions developing this approach we felt the need to also pose some crucial questions as to what do we have to account for if we really want to to um, act up on directly driven, uh, so participatory research co-designed and directly driven by citizen groups. And uh, this is where 
actually also during dot two years ago we came up with a number of topics um i guess we shift the and what we wanted is to capture voices from around the globe. So show, bring more diversity into the discussions we had within COACT. So different political, cultural, uh, infrastructural, economic, et cetera, context, and um, unpack what that means uh, to actually develop such an approach and how also this looks like in practice. Um, and then of course, um, ultimately, um resulting in uh, unpacking what uh, in citizen social science approach needs to account for in order to to be truly inclusive to to act up on 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 um these claims of diversity and we had five topics identified as kind of driving questions we thought that had to be addressed with more depth which were these five here and what we did is we started to have uh, each month dedicated to one topic. We hosted a hangout where everyone who wanted could join. Uh, it was were pub these were public events where we, discu we discussed and, and located, so to say, uh, each topic respectively. And then we had an open call for contributions. And this is uh, what resulted in, in uh, the, the blog post contributions of our, our authors we want to celebrate today and thank everyone who took the time and their effort and their, their resources in that way to, to contribute with their local perspectives and also uh, showcasing their local practices and how certain things are actually possible. So thanks everyone so much. I don't know whom of you is in the room now. Maybe we can briefly all switch on the cameras and wave like everyone who all our authors i think we have whom do we have here we have nadine we have julia we have jill i think i saw before we have andrew hello andrew i hope i was just scrolling up and down didn't oversee anyone but i, I will introduce you all now so um yeah, that's what we did. And we, I will briefly talk a bit about the five topics and introduce the different contributions because this is what we actually want to, to showcase today and to celebrate. So uh, locally driven protocols and local traditions in science. Um, this is where we ask the questions, what is required in order to reframe the mainstream understanding of expertise and adopt protocols of local communities as common practice? And how can local traditions such as rituals and mythology be embraced as a central component of, uh, of CSS methodolo um, methodology? And under this topic, we had the fantastic contribution of Nadine, who is with us here today from Boa Lab in Cameroon, who highlighted how um, local protocols such as traditional rituals that are used by, by local communities perhaps don't have the, the scientific, um, where people perhaps don't have the scientific knowledge to, in terms of explaining in dominant scientific terms what they are doing and therefore um, uh, protocoling, documenting respectively, but that these methods are still robust scientific methods with reproducibility, which is shown how, by how they are carried out over and over again over long periods of time. So, there she actually posed the question of or you know, raised the question of that traditional practices um, need to be recognized as solid scientific methods and what rather needs to be then looked into is how can we work with certain dominant academic or scientific methods uh, to to help document since uh, these are there we have the methodological repertoire um, for standardization of procedures but um, they are limited in, in inclusive applicability since they re usually require advanced skills that lo are locally not available and so on. Whereas local methods whose implementation and validation do not require advanced skills and they are needs driven, um, embedded in local context and so on uh, are still there. So she has been showing in her contribution, which you can, can all read on, on the website, how, um, how Mboa Lab is working with community-based researchers to actually overcome um, or address this issue. 
So thank you so much for, for this fantastic contribution and I encourage everyone to, to have a read. And then our next topic was the ownership of science, where we asked the question, what role should and can or can a citizen social science play in bringing science back to its original owners, which of course totally relates um, to what already Nadine tapped into. No? And there um, we had uh, two contributions. One was uh, Jill Gilberto from Data Lab in, in Brazil, who posed the question quite um, directly, who does science belong to? And discussed the, um, that, that politics and science actually have to be um, discussed together, that there are two sides of the same coin. And that we have to un unmantle where are the boundaries in constructing future science in the way it's done by at the moment no so also raising what nadine tapped into that the copying of epistemologies um for from the the dominant science what we call it um to to the peripheries do harm uh because they also don't challenge the 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 basic framing of of science um and he shows how him with his organization data levy are addressing this by their um, practices around citizen generation of data. So you, I invite you to, to read his contribution to learn more about this. Um, and also uh, he highlighted the fact that this has not always been like this, but that the, the, the recognition and acknowledgement of local traditions, rituals, et cetera, have had a very different positioning prior to the the arrival of western science basically who has been undermining to a large extent these traditional practices and also in terms of standardizing and institutionalizing practices the practices um, in those regards so thanks so much jill and yeah uh, and your yeah jill's article is even available in in portuguese and in in english so here we even have um, yeah two options uh, for reading and then yine uh, from from Google's uh, ICT initiative in South Sudan. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're with us, Ine. So she also wrote on the ownership of science, um, providing us with a really practical insight, a direct insight in their local practices and how they are reactively addressing shortcomings in their direct environments. And she wrote about um, their activities in response to the lack of hand sanitizers in the beginning of um, COVID-19 and how they address this um, by using local scientific practices. So looking into how can they create a highly concentrated um, alcohol which was needed as the base in order to to produce hand sanitizers and how they broke through across silos. So looking uh, out of the box into, into what other kind of groups or practices do require this and where can we learn from where we otherwise don't have access because the whole pharmaceutical environment is totally locked up. Finding support in, in uh, networks of female brewers in South Sudan where the strong tradition is that, that, female, uh, that, that women brew a certain type of alcohol and therefore have to produce the same kind of highly concentrated alcohol. So she wonderfully describes how this networking, learning from each other, building on this and challenging uh, and, and addressing challenges as they came along actually can be overcome. And what started in their case with some fast reaction to a necessity on the ground actually resulted in a fully labeled, documented, standardized, licensed, product that they are now having and a full lab that they also were able to set up for the production etc so thank you so much Tina to demonstrate us how things are possible when when really growing from from the ground and from within from a need and looking into how things are locally already done also if not in our thematic sector so that was the second topic, then decolonize, uh, decolonizing our educational and institutional influences. And here we ask ourselves, how can Western and non-Western scientists liberate themselves from Western institutional instructions? And here I want to thank Andrew so much. I think Andrew, you were 
I was so far, we don't want to stop with this publication series, um, but only contributor who hadn't been like a core gig member before. And Nadine, I think you invited Andrew and thank you so much for this. Um, and Andrew shared with us uh, or discussed with us um, how the colonial heritage of educational systems actually affects educational systems in, in many um, countries and in his case in South Sudan today um, and showing us how where the system is changing very slow and you no know, institutional mills are are very slow um, they are trying to to push change from within by in his case as a philosophy professor at the University of Tuba actually um, adjusting the curriculum from within meaning bringing in African philosophy, African philosophers into the curriculum in order to open up, um, open up the system or to broaden the system um, from within and, and until there's systematic change also um, happening. And he also advocates for um, where or if schools don't incorporate local perspectives and indigenous knowledge, or at least not at the pace that it would be needed, um, that independent formalization uh, should be available and remain an option always. So providing alternative spaces of learning, of teaching, of sharing knowledge, as we see in a lot of maker spaces, innovation spaces, innovation hubs around the world, also in the global innovation gathering community. Uh, so raising the flag of how, how these alternative education environments are playing a very crucial role because of systemic change often just not going at the pace that it has to. Thank you so much, Andrew, for, for this wonderful contribution as well. And then our fourth topic was overcoming fa whoop, failed representation in participatory processes, where we posed the question, what is required to fully open the black box of participatory, um, of participatory, of participation? general basically and here we also had uh, two contributions thank you so much julia and can julia um Kleberg from junge tüftler in germany in berlin she um um shared with us how they work with with schools um using self-awareness as a tool for building empathy and facilitating change of perspectives and they work with um, um engaging like through experiential learning, um, school classes into finding solutions, uh, developing solutions, ideas, and prototyping. And in this case, she uh, shared the example on how they have been working with school classes um, on finding solutions, inclusive solutions for persons with different types of disability to, um, to not face the barriers that that they face in in the day-to-day -day classroom environment and having um, peers, so having other students, pupils without um, without uh, any physical or motoric or, or so on limitations actually experience what it means if you cannot stand up or if you don't see, et cetera, um, and how, how, that, uh, how that changes your experience and, and so on. So thank you so much for this, um, advocating the power also of maker spaces and also showing how making can be brought directly into the classroom or into other environments. Um, and it's not necessarily a physical space outside of where change is supposed or encouraged to happen. And then thanks so much for Khan from the Canadian Community-Based Research Network who shared with us their account of how they have been trying through conversation cycles in certain direct neighborhoods um, to shift research agendas. So moving and, and to move closer to the neighborhoods where, where they work with. So they have been trying out to engage um, everyday citizens into not only the identification of topics that are relevant to them, but also bringing certain topics mm, closer to them and engaging them into the discussion in exploration um around this so thank you so much we have another post in the making for our final topic which is uh, ethical standard setting in open citizen social science communities where we have posed the questions 
what is required in order to establish and follow ethical standards and enact deriving protocols. Oh, I have a typo here, sorry for this, in open citizen social science processes. So for this one, but also for all the others, we still encourage contribution. We want to hear what you are doing in your direct communities. Uh, and we also want to hear uh, your uh, general reflections, philosophical, sociological, political, whatever drives you and moves you when thinking about these topics. We would love to, to hear um, yeah, your takes on this from your very specific context. So um, I will stop with this here. Uh, and I would love to invite our authors, those that joined us today, to, well, I have a few questions, but be before I would ask if there are questions actually from the audience in general or to the authors in order to not uh, dominate the whole <laughs> time we have. So if there are any questions right now, please do speak up or raise your hand in the, in the emoticon option um, in, the, in, the, in the bar on top or above, depending on where you, where you have it. Andrew. Yes, hello? Yes, we can hello. hear you well. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Kirsty. This is, uh, this is very lovely. It's nice to, to see you again and to meet some of my fellow, fellow participants. I think we've maybe met, be met before in some of the previous calls. Uh, my my question. I just wanted to the last. Uh, I don't remember. I think it was Julia. Was it? I I had a question. Um, I I guess it's it, it's an ethical question. When when you're talking to to some of the youth, how did you how did you approach them? Were 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 these people you you knew? Or I'm um, I'm just curious. What, was it in an official capacity that you now had to, uh, I, I, I don't know if, if my question is, is clear. Because I think usually, that, mm -hmm. uh, hello? I think yeah. it's quite yes, clear, hello, but uh, Julia, you, you need to answer. So maybe uh, <laughs> I- How, how we approach the youth. The question is how we approach the youth, right? Yes, yes, I'm sure it's a delicate, uh, uh, question because you know um you have your objectives as a researcher there are things you want from them right and um not really and, so we are not we are not approaching them uh, in terms of research we're more approaching them from we're coming more from a learning approach and we uh, what we say is we really want to um yeah, to empower kids that they can understand and what what tools are around them and to understand them how they can use it to uh, to live up to their own potentials. So it's not really mm -hmm. a research position we come from. It's more from a Befähigungsansatz, <laughs> so more to empower them. So it's really more about mm -hmm. uh, empowering them. And um, what we actually do is when we uh, when we go to classes is um, that we that we show or uh, that we say we have uh, we have a problem but we don't have a solution. And can we find it? Uh, can we find it together? So this is actually the way we we approach them. We say you know you know best the solutions. So we say you are the experts of your of your surrounding and of your environment and and and, and we and empower you you give we give you the tools to come up with the solutions and to uh, and to create mm -hmm. and in in your experience they they know their solutions very well you think no they don't know it in the beginning it's an open process we also don't know it's always open ended we, we never know what comes out when we do our workshops uh, we never know what will come out Sometimes also it, it's it's more we it's really it's really a process. So um, it, we have a question and then um, we ask for in, in this case for example what I uh, described in the uh, in the blog post was um, we want to find out just imagine it's about kids' rights and we, we were just ima children's rights. We just imagine there are people in your classroom who are blind or who are, who are not able to walk and uh, who are in a wheelchair. Just imagine if they have the same rights. As 
as you have and should be able to move as freely as you do uh, what would have to change in your in your daily in, in in your daily routine and then we went through them through the through the school building and then they discovered oh if I would sit in a wheelchair, I couldn't do this and that. And then they were, okay, mm -hmm. how can I solve this problem? Mm -hmm. What can I do? What can we, what can we up, come up with? So, and we said, here are tools and we help you to, to use the tools and to come up with ideas and, and prototype them. It's about prototyping. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. It's really, really fascinating to hear about it actually. Are there any other questions or, or comments, statements? Curiosities? <laughs> if not, uh, maybe, yeah, I, I, um, I mean, I hope there will be more questions. I give you some more time, but also otherwise would be, would be nice. So from our side, of course, um, as we, we came up with this idea also kind of out of the process and what can we do to, to bring more voices into this and we have a big community, but what's the best format and so on. We, we just started that also a bit out of, yeah, in, in a reactional way. Um, and so having done this being through the first process of this now coming to an end, which is not an end, it would be lovely to hear from everyone who joined and thank you again so much. Um, to, to hear about your motivations to, to, you know, when you read about what we plan to be like, yeah, I'm willing to pull in this time in order to share my story because I consider it important. So I don't know if any one of you would, you would like to share their motivations of, of why, why you decide to, to, to join this, this activity or other similar ones. Chill. And you were also our first author who jumped right into the boat. So <laughs> you were the, it would yeah. be nice to, to hear um, from you. Yes. Um, I don't have too much to say, but just to contribute here, maybe I'm so uh, happy with the this results and so glad to be, have been participate on that. So thank you for, for all work and the invitation and everything. But what makes me engage on this since the beginning beginning um, of the idea of the Coact project is the uh, is the the idea of the science as an environment are in dispute you know so and it's important to and, and it's it's an unfair dispute you know the the force and the power when we think about what is uh, established at as knowledge and as social science, uh, it's so powerful. And we are seeing on this on, on this crisis of the truth, especially in, in these countries who, which the right wings uh, are so uh, engaged on dispute, not just the science, but also the truth. It's super important that we could have some space to talk about other kind of experiences that is very very close to to um to what we what you think about the the life the daily life the world the politicians the 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 cultures of of our of our countries and and and, and people so what i mean is um for me it's super important to talk about science as another way maybe a little out of the academic space but also in there to try to understand how can we put these two things that for me have been never could be aparted together again you know and I mean yeah. society really society community practices and and this academic field that became so far away from the daily culture of people. So for me, it's the thing that most makes me more uh, engaged and happy on bring people to write stories or, or write my own stories about how can we dispute science on this time. So Thank you so much. Yeah, and we were, yeah, really thanks again for your contribution. And, and even this also showing like, 
bringing up the, the political discussion, but then also showing hands on it actually exists like this is what we do every day so it's not that this is something unreachable far out there that we have to somehow get to but how no how stories uh, stories how structurally practices of this kind exist on a day-to-day -day basis in so many places or in communities so thanks so much anyone else who would like to, to share what made them um spare their time for valuable time for us and share their stories for this publication. Hey, hi, um, I'd just like to share a little bit of my motivation and some um, reflections or questions I've also realized after participating in this whole project. So um, for me, my main um, motivation for the co-art project was the whole idea of um, trying to contextualize science, like how can we make science more accessible? Um, even though um, we strive to um, like try to make protocols or scientific protocols more standardized, but then how do we work in a way that we don't drift away from the people who originally started the whole um, science or we don't drift away from the foundation, like, we all live science every day. We do science. Everybody does science in every little thing they do. So how do we now modernize it in a way that um, we are still able to let everyone participate in what they do? So um, I think this is the main focus for me, and also to help like scale up in a, in in uh, in the local context. Like the local communities, they are able to do things, they are able to produce things on their own, but then how do they, or how are they able to be able to make it to, to meet the demand as the population is growing or as need may arise, as we saw in the case of the pandemic and all. And um, following all this, I think I have more questions than clarifications. I was also able to read, um, contribution from other authors. And I realized it's a whole um, connection. There is one central thing which we are all working towards, like involving um, the population, involving or open science or citizen social science. But then um, the question that I think um, I need some clarification with, I don't know if we can answer them or it's still a pending question, it's like, the ethical part of it, I was happy to see that this also came up as part of the reflection for next time. Like, how are we able to, or is there, or are they like policies to guide um, how we use um, information from um, the citizen or information from the population? Like, what do we do with this information? Are we able to communicate with them? Do they understand? the purpose, why we approach them or involve them in some of these works. And are they comfortable? Do they, are they able to have feedback on how this information is used, especially if um, it has to do with some very personal or um, traditional or ritual kind of information. And um, another need, that I think um, it's important we focus on is how we are able to measure the impacts we get from all of this work or research. Like, are we able to go back and see how much um, change we are making or um, will it just end at our levels? Are we just comfortable talking about them, knowing that this is what is supposed to be done? knowing that this is what has been done already, or are we able to focus on some gaps that um, we are, we still need to be able to fill? Thanks, yeah, Nadine. I think, um, mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're raising super central points, of course. Um, and a lot of them that are not focusing more on the overall project. Um, points that yeah that are under discussion and also we, we had two weeks ago or so uh, our final what we called final event with the 
with the panel discussion, what Jill was also taking part, where uh, our research and innovation actors, so the consortium partners actually doing the citizen engaged research, have been sharing their learnings and that also addressed a lot of these aspects. No, so um, or also our our respondents like Jill and and other people from our community actually raised these issues as well. No, what's in there for us? Like they are all the time. No, always researchers coming in, no, in different. Uh, levels and engaging communities uh, to, to diff different extents but if we really pin it down what is in there for us what do we get out of this what does really feedback and how far do we come in with something that is actually really needed etc so I don't have a, an, a solution to that right now but it is very clear that uh, despite no all the these new approaches and and that these topics are discussed more critical I think that's already an achievement, but that's not the end. That shouldn't be the end of it, no? I think we 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 can see how discussions are opening up that we haven't been ha having in a long time. I wouldn't even say never been having because there have also been sort of waves in in certain communities uh, over decades that got been that that got lost on the way, and now are coming back, and that is great to see. But there's still so much to do. And that also links kind of to my next question, but I see Sandra raised her hand. Yeah, because I offered to anybody um, to write her uh, to read out their statements. And uh, Yine Yenki from South Sudan, from Google's SET, also um, wrote a statement and it very much connects uh, to the discussion just now, also around what is science. And she says, my motivation to write about our work was to shade light to how much women have, women have contributed to science and still continue to contribute, yet such efforts are not talked about or published anywhere like uh, the the understanding also what what science is is very like dominated by who who is cited who is published uh, in dominant journals right and so so all the work uh, we see in 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 less less dominating fields <laughs> yeah it's, uh, yeah not considered science uh, in the original term Mm. So thank you so much, Yine. Thanks a lot, Yine. Yeah, and indeed, no, this um it leaves traces across like the whole spectrum of things, being no, being at language, being at repositories, no, where is uh where's information shared, how is it fed back to, in what way also, no, in what type of um uh, lingua in terms of scientific or actually applicable to to non-scientific communities, etc. pp. So, yeah, my next question was like, what, what do you think um, efforts like this can achieve? But also, of course, totally linked to that, what, what more or what else is needed? So I think we, we, we're in a momentum where we see these, Christ, these questions and concerns more publicly raised also across different communities and also different communities coming closer together, seeing how we are struggling for the same or how are we are concerned by by the same kind of um, power imbalances, but yeah, what what can can efforts like like this publication actually achieve, and 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 what what not? So what more is needed? That would a bit be a bit of my my questions to to post to you as well, or, or which would be great to to talk about. So also from the perspective for COACT and also for GIG, like wh where where can we go with this and and where else should we focus on to make sure this is not just a conversation? Andrew. Uh, hello? Yeah, we can hear uh, you well. Uh, okay, good. Uh, I, I'd like to, to take that question about um, where do we go from here or how can we, I think, measure or gauge our, our our impact from from here I, I think this ties to the question of what is science that everybody has been asking um to me i i i think of it as um there's the there's the outputs of science so the the products of science uh, and then there's the activity of science itself you know the the labs or the academia or whatever and so that's how we gauge the impact uh, Kirsty, I think you're right when you said that this is an achievement 
in itself because um, to be honest, uh, just this question, what is science, the fact that it's being asked now to practitioners, it might be very clear to scientists, okay, that they know what science is, science is scientific method and, and they know how to do science and that's fine. But what attracted me to this uh, project is social science and it's from social science do you get this uh this democratic aspect of it uh nadine brought up this the the, the question of privacy that citizens they are they are they are not just um consumers of science they are creators of it because we get their our data from from them and if if we're making the products for them then it seems like Everything is for them, and 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 so they own it. So um, to answer your question, I think how do we how do we gauge impact is honestly to me personally. The more I hear decolonization, the more I hear open science being talked about, then I know things are that that there's an impact. The more I see people thinking that okay, it's not just scientists who have to be you know, learning science. Um, and, and I see this every day, even as some of the work that I've done with uh, Yene, who brought me onto this project, uh, we used to work about, uh, um, work with trying to bring science to everybody, that it's not just, it's not just, science education is not just for training scientists, but I think Gilberto said this, that um, we are all consumers of science. Uh, you know, we, everybody is a science, so we can all benefit from that scientific, knowledge and it can be subtle but slowly but surely people will start saying that okay i know this i know this you know i know the science it's, and so i'm a scientist myself in a way i think that's what i wanted to say i hope Thanks i will be sweating <laughs> thank you so much yeah indeed so um making it a topic as as a first step um shifting this this perspective on ownership and so on but then of course we still and uh, your oil contributions also partially uh raised um this issue that we are still in certain institutional or systemic structures that that don't allow us to go all out all out there right so project frameworks of funding still you know, are not being channeled through certain Western institutions and what that means in terms of equal ownership, uh, for instance, and, and all these things. So maybe someone else also wants to, to share their, their opinions on, yeah, well, not to till what uh, extent these kind of activities can bring added value, but um, yeah, what, what else is concretely needed? So we can make sure that also structurally on a longer term, this leads to, leads to actually implemented change that supports all the kind of activities and organizational types and dynamics that you guys all actually already show that it's possible to practice them no? in your specific, in, in your respective context. Anyone else? What what do we need to support these discussions more, these activities more, and also activities that already exist to be recognized the way they should? I don't know if there are actually also comments in the chat. Mm. I think from my perspective, it would be very interesting to share, you know, the ownership of science, like all the money that's funded, you know. So how can we get scientific funding for more on the ground scientific development? You know, maybe this is a how to, you know, because just like you said to uh, Andrew, uh, I'm afraid 
that we can debate for long who are the scientists, who are the object of science. Yeah. Uh, while hundreds of Elon Musks will be doing tons of money with science related products, you know? So maybe go one step further is to fund local science, you know? And, and understand how, what are the outcomes of this, just like Nadine is yogurt from powder milk or hand sanitizers or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that directly links to fund local science, but therefore recognize local science as um, in the same way then then dominant science is uh, is respectively recognized and and bring it to the same attention in the same environments and for research that is done in the dominant science way to make sure to also bring it to where it belongs no bring the results to 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 where they belong so they can actually um so people can actually benefit from them so then that relates also to how knowledge is shared no, and in which ways, in which formats, and that of course also relates to to certain policy and and funding structures. Perhaps I don't know, Jill or anyone else can maybe yes. you can can you share about how yeah how you yes. do this in in your yes it's organization? it's hard to me to talk about um um perspectives because um and I. I used to be totally agree with Ricardo about funding and about support for, for, for make this kind of work here, because I don't know if you know, but we passed through a moment here in Brazil because um, uh, two weeks ago, a million of researchers from different, uh, for all the, the, the universities of the country had no, uh, uh, there no, no fellowship money of the month because the government simply said, we don't have any money for science anymore, for any science, any kind of science that the, the fellowship that the researchers, million of researchers in the country received. It's not too much money, uh, but yes, we passed like uh, 10 days in super tense way because we didn't have our fellowship money, our public fellowship money that we as researchers we received. So imagine there's no mm. there's there's even the the minimum for for make the traditional research imagine if we you know uh, um proposing uh, other kinds of uh, uh models and and more diversity to the to the structures of science that is already um uh, uh structured so what i mean is Yes, we need cooperation, you know, I think we need cooperation, especially international cooperation. Uh, I think our network is super um, um, nice and rich because of this, you know, because we can share some different perspectives on, on, on our uh, um, environmentals and, and maybe continue to to open this idea of science and especially social science with the North um universities and with the north uh, academic fields and trying to to bring them to 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 our to our field and try to exchange with there so i don't know i just think about open the networks and yes fight for fund you know for for make this kind of social and open science more uh, more broadly more openly um i don't know just left ideas but yes just yeah yeah thanks a lot so intensifying or broadening and diversifying funding basically any any other comments or or um, reflections on on this what would be needed um yeah also perhaps from your yeah, from from your local accounts, your um, perspectives on regarding regarding your projects. Deliver access, you know, 
not only the access, but how to deliver the access, but because it's such a bubble, you know, or such hundreds of small bubbles. And when you look around, you have a scene of some people, you know? I'm not saying that we should expand the bubble as the size of the planet, because we already have this planet-sized bubble, but we can have a small bubbles a little bit bigger, you know, is smaller, is small bubble. No, sorry, bigger is small bubbles, you know. Uh, 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 to study, you know, to study, to research, it's out fashion. Uh, the young generation and a lot of people in the global south, uh, they are more into uh, build the, their shop for car accessories and get a minimum wage a little bit higher than something and think that they are already rich because they can use that kind of things on the video clips they saw on YouTube, you know? So when I see in my reality, to study is out of date, you know? It's something from the past. People really are not engaged into this. It's, it's not attractive, you know? And this is very worrying. You, a lot of people know the si political situation in Brazil, you know? And, and that's the main reason. Yeah. So we are discussing science and what people do in the field and if this is science or not. Basic education levels are horrible in most of the global south. And then the fundamental level, most of the times is even worse. And when you reach to somewhere, you know, and then you have what people call degrees, like bachelors or whatever, uh, it's it's a mixture of running for money and running for life. And almost no one is running to understand, you know? It's, so we are in a tricky situation, you yeah. know? Uh, I mean, maybe for the, <laughs> for the sake of time. Yeah, Andrew has the hand, sorry, because, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe briefly, I mean, of course, like, um, <laughs> we, have, we have bigger and more fundamental structural problems in terms of but political disenchantment and, and also probably knowledge-related educational disenchantment, I guess, uh, has been happened always and across very different uh, environments, um, and we're probably not going to solve everything, but... Um, <laughs> If I translate this into making knowledge creation and knowledge sharing more applicable, applicable to specific target groups or um, let me call it stakeholder groups, not targets, since we talk about engagement, actually, I think we, we are on a, on a meaningful track. And then within our direct environment on, on which we are trying to solve, um, diversifying and, and yeah, also making what we do, translating what we do into the context and and language in terms of you no know, um, also of ways of talking about things for more uh for a bigger diversity of groups is is perhaps a step like within the process of maybe this is something to to share as well of um creating noise around the publication and and, and engaging people i've been addressing various big networks and groups who work on inclusion who work on these topics but who who quite directly expressed their concern about the the lingua we use the no social science what's that like ah these practices well we've always been doing this in our activist networks and so on so being more sensitive also to what we do it's not reinvent it's not inventing the wheel but it's it's something that we term in a certain way and frame in a certain way and it's about perhaps also understanding how the same practices and discussions but in different kind of ways happen in other communities so that we can join forces and and come out stronger and i leave it to this and hand over to andrew and then there's also sandra who is uh, uh, 
thank you. I'll I'll be very quick. You actually said what I wanted to say mostly about Sorry. Uh, framing, about um, how we make it. Uh, how did you say it? Yeah, terming and framing. Basically, mm. that we're not trying to make anything new. Uh, we all love science, and we all think it's great. And uh, what Ricardo said earlier, it um, I, I wanted to, to just respond to that really quickly because uh, you know, being a philosopher, it just uh, it just hit me immediately. Um, I used to teach um, epistemology, which is theory of knowledge, and uh, we always make the assumption that oh, everybody wants knowledge, and everybody loves should want knowledge or should want science, and what Ricardo said, and I think uh, Gail Berta also alluded to this, um, is that there are some people who don't care, or they really don't care about science, and they, really, and they don't care about knowledge. And we're not talking about people on the streets, we're talking about big politicians, people in positions of power. And so what do we do? What do we do? Um, I think our problem remains the same. How do we make knowledge more attractive? Um, there's something, um, Socrates used to say is that it's not so much uh, what are the conditions for knowledge, but what kind of person is it that wants knowledge? You know, it, it, it's about, and and I guess cultivating that, maybe that goes beyond science. It, it's just, you know, culture, I suppose now. Um, okay, just one last thing to respond to what Gil said about the funding issue. I know that's in the background and and and, and you can't ignore that. Um, what What, in my own experience, and Ine can testify this uh, to this because she and I work on a lot of similar projects. Is okay. We're getting funding from outside because we can't fund it ourselves. But um, before that comes, we have done a lot ourselves. We have done a lot on ourselves, and that's the beginning. That we show that okay, if we could have done this much by ourselves, surely anybody can do this much by themselves. And you know, now it's about getting help, and we all need a little help. And and that's okay too. <laughs> okay, Thank you so there. much, Andrew. Thanks a lot. We have a minute left, Sandra. I will. Yes, I raised my hand to remind you of taking the selfie because you asked me to. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it would be amazing to switch off everybody's, uh, switch on everybody's camera so we can actually take a screenshot. Maybe also, Kirsty, it's a good time to uh switch off the screen sharing um here we go and switch off my raising my hand <laughs> can have any other you can have any other like things in your hands or any other re reaction <laughs> emojis that you like so Gine, if it's possible, and Julia and Anna um, to switch on your cameras for the selfie <laughs> or for the thing. We can also hide the caption <laughs> for this. So good. So maybe make some make some smile or something else that you like to do. So nice to see. And then I had the urge uh, <laughs> to ask Khan uh, to um, yeah, add to the discussion we just had, because I think his um, blog post um, describing the circles also brings a lot of these elements of how do you engage with every like with citizens in your neighborhoods, with people in your neighborhoods, um, and really have an infrastructure or have uh, something to um something to engage people in this kind of knowledge creation that is um informal and not this uh, classical sense of science uh, thing. So, so i would love to hear from you if if you allow <laughs> and okay. if we can take this one more minute or two more minutes um. i th i think uh, in our situation the desire was to have a physical place to to go and uh, and to sit around and basically discuss issues that has come up because it's been uh, hardly any place to go other than if you went to organize lectures, paid lectures, or or events organized and sponsored by universities. Not everybody has have access to those venues. So so we basically started with this premises that we are actually able to 
have a conversation among us about issues that we care for. And also that we'll be engaging and creating knowledge. But more importantly, from our perspective was the fact that whatever we create, we will be independent. And this was a big challenge because most of the time you engage into, into some funding, some sort of a funding formulation and you get funded, you could do a project, you could do proposals, blah, blah, all the stuff you do. And then, um, and then in the end, actually you lose that because um, you have to streamline the knowledge making process into a formula, which is uh, basically designed uh, by, the, by the funding. So we chose not to seek any funding. In fact, it's quite, it was quite interesting as we, as we moved on to this conversation circles, bringing people around different issues. I've been approached by several funders to, um, to fund us, to give us money. And we actually rejected that. We said, no, we do not want any funding uh, because they, uh, again, there's a whole question on uh, the notion of independence. One other thing that I should leave with everyone is the fact is that we found in the course of um, well over two years that given people the opportunity, everybody has not only something to say, but also have things, something scientific to say. If you if you if you move the 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 um, labels and uh, making science something of everyday uh, part of everyday life, it's kind of interesting. We found that. Everybody has something to say. And the circle we were setting, and we were just basically saying everything is open and free, but everyone must say something. Doesn't matter what it is, but you should say something. Should not leave the room without saying something. And it was quite remarkable how much people had to say when they had the opportunity to say so, as opposed to your typical discussions where there are four or five people dominate the discussion and you go back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> And the rest of the people become audience. We eliminated audience in that sense because everybody was actually generally participant. And uh, what we call the conversation starters or people who started the conversation, they could only talk for 20 minutes, share their knowledge. And then after that, they were part of the, part, part of the group. Thanks a lot, Khan. Very, very insightful. Um, yeah, somewhere where we can apply this circle practice in some of our events and gatherings as well. Uh, for the sake of time, I would like to not cut off this conversation. I would actually really love to find ways to carry on these conversations that we had the honor to, the, the space to, to develop and to, to, to have over the last three weeks, three years or two of COACT and also to encourage everyone to invite more people to join these contributions. Um, we, we will certainly look into finding ways on how we can keep this going and also do something with all these contributions that we gather so that they, they become the platform they deserve and are heard and read and seen by by uh, more people and um, and also different kind of stakeholders, be it from academia, be it from po uh, from policy or else. Um, and thanks again, everyone who took the time, their valuable time, to share their very great great um, insights from from the daily their daily practices and and great work they actually do in in all your different country contexts. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful and thankful for what we achieved with the options we had so far. And, and I really hope to see this uh, flourishing further as well. Thank you so much, everyone. You'll hear from us. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Sandra posted the, the newsletter link so you can subscribe also in the, in the chat. We will we, we stay here for for the Pilates session and for the next session, or will we change the room? We stay in this room. Oh, and, amazing. Uh, so feel free to stay in the room, the room as well. <laughs>